Well, good morning and welcome to our midweek lesson. And our theme in the midweek is, on Wednesday, is discipleship evangelism. And this is taken from the manual that was written by Andrew Womack and Don Crow. And <coughs> it is uh, a guideline for people when they're trying to disciple people and help them to understand what the kingdom of God <coughs> is all about. And we stopped at the middle of the last lesson. There were a lot of questions that he gave in this particular lesson, but we'll start with reviewing about the king and his kingdom. We'll pick up and then we'll go to the Q&A session where we left off. Uh, we have about 11 more questions that he gave. So let's begin looking at the king and his kingdom. And of course, in our last lesson, we we talked about the fact that God, from the very beginning with uh, Moses and the children of Israel, when he led them out of Egypt, <coughs> and they went to the Mount Sinai, and Moses went up on the mountain, and God gave him all the instructions that he would need to form a nation because here you had a people that had been in slavery for hundreds of years and they never had the opportunity to have a government of their own. And with Moses growing up in Pharaoh's household, he was very familiar with uh, government and law and the military and all the things that are necessary that a nation has to have. But the thing was that God never told them that they were to have a human king, that he wanted to be the one that they would turn to and that they would look to to help them in their situations. So he did not want them to seek an earthly king. But as time went on, that's exactly what the people of Israel cried out for. And during the time of Samuel, who was the last of the judges, the people said, well, your sons do not follow in your footsteps. Give us a king. Well, this grieved Samuel because he knew that the Lord wanted to be the king over his people. And yet the people wanted an earthly king, and the Lord said, give it to them. But also tell them what a king will do. Give them warning about taxation and drafting in the military and so forth. But they still wanted to be like the other nations. But the thing is that God does have a kingdom. And the people of Israel were always looking for the Mashiach, the anointed one, the one who would rule and reign here upon this earth over the nation of Israel. And of course, Jesus was the anointed one. He was the Mashiach. That's what, where we get the word Messiah or Christos, which, is, which means the anointed one. So we do have a kingdom. So the thing is that the body of Christ... I think we focus more on individuals and we think that that is what the Lord wants us to do. But Jesus commissioned us to go and make disciples of nations. And to make disciples of nations, you have to get to the top of the um, 
mountains of influence in the society. That means in government and politics and law and business and entertainment, education, the whole nine yards. That we have to influence the culture of a nation. And that's what we as the body of Christ in the past decades, we've not done that. We've allowed Satan to take control of those mountains of influence in our culture, in our society. And that's why we're at the point where we are today that there has been so much corruption, so much uh, confusion, so much turmoil that we're going through now to try to bring us back to where we need to be. Where the church really needs to be the ones that are impacting <clears throat> impacting our nation and influencing the culture and to get into the educational institutions instead of having it crammed down our throats that we have to teach sex ed education according to their point of view, their world view, instead of giving God's world view. And the problem is that the church really doesn't have a biblical world view. The church, for the most part, is no different than the rest of the world. They act the same, they think the same, they go to the same places. So where is the distinction? So as Don says here in this lesson, it's impossible to understand the message of Jesus without this basic understanding of the kingdom. A kingdom is a reign, a dominion. It is a nation or an empire, groups of nations. And we know that when Jesus does return to this earth, that he will set up an earthly kingdom and will rule and reign for a thousand years here upon this earth. He wants, but he wants a kingdom now. Not necessarily that, <clears throat> um, you know, physically now, but spiritually we are in the kingdom of God if we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But he wants us to impact the world around us. Not just our home, our family, our, as individuals, but as communities, as states, as a nation, as the world. We are to impact the world, be world changers. This is something that those that are on the left understand very well. They have been indoctrinating our culture for decades now and have gotten us away, further and further and further away from the ways of the Lord and from a biblical worldview. They've been, they've been doing what the church should be doing. We should be indoctrinating the world and the culture concerning the things of God. But we've been slack. We have been passive. We have been politically correct and have been afraid or ashamed of the gospel. We're afraid that we're going to offend someone. Well, the cross of Christ is offensive, and we have to realize that there is a price to pay. Now, the message that we preach, often referred to as a message of salvation or of eternal life. But the thing is, it's not just about the sweet by and by. It should be what we do here on this earth. So Don says within the phrase, the kingdom of God is the idea of a group of people that would be ruled by God. 
have a biblical worldview and be ruled by what his word says. In order to enter God's kingdom, conditions had to be met. A change of heart was required. This change of heart is what the Bible calls repentance. It's a change of heart towards God. And it's a turning away from Satan, sin, and its ways. Unto God, Christ, and his ways. We have to, you know, there's a choice. Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. But broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many are going that route. But we have to make that choice. Whose kingdom are we a part of? Are we part of the kingdom of God? Or are we a part of the kingdom of Satan? So as we turn to God, he offers us the forgiveness of sin. He offers us everlasting life. This is good news. And so it's referred to as the gospel of grace. It's not that we deserve it or earn it. God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the kingdom of God is character, characterized by grace, unmerited favor, something that we didn't deserve or earn. And it came subtly, quietly, secretly in the ministry of Jesus. And there will be a final and visible consummation of that when Jesus does rule and reign on this earth. So with that intro, let's get back to the Q&A se session. And it says, read Acts chapter 19, verses 8 through 10. So Acts chapter 19 says, And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when several were hardened and believed not, but spoke evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So Paul, in his missionary journey, sometimes he didn't stay very long at one place, but here... It said he stayed two solid years. And I believe this was Ephesus. But anyway, he stayed two solid years there teaching. And because, you know, he was receiving uh, some people that were coming against him, he went, he left the synagogue and he went into the school of Tyrannus. And he spoke to them from the school. So you don't have to be in a church building. We use the word church, but that's not in the Bible. That's a bad translation of the Greek word, which is ecclesia, which means an assembly, a congregation. In other words, it's people who believe and follow the Lord Jesus. It's not a building. It's not a structure. But that's what we have throughout our history. That's what we've done. We've made it more into a program, a performance, a building, instead of an assembly of people who are praying and studying the Word of God together and are fellowshipping with, with one another on a very regular basis. But anyway, here he is in Ephesus, and the question is, Paul spoke boldly in Ephesus, disputing and persuading others concerning what? Well, he spoke to them daily 
disputing and persuading the things concerning what? The kingdom of God. This is a kingdom. That we have a king. That we're part of a kingdom. We're part of his realm. Our king is King Jesus. And it's not a physical kingdom now. But we are part of his kingdom. The kingdom of God. And that's what Paul was uh, disputing and persuading the people there in Ephesus. Now the next question. Read Acts 28 verses 23 through 31. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After Paul had spoken one word, well spoke the Holy Spirit by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed, and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in to him, preaching what the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concerns the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So this is when Paul had been taken to Rome. This was his last journey. That he was going to Rome. He wanted to stand before Caesar. He said, if I've done any wrong, anything wrong, and you haven't found anything wrong with me, I, need, I want to appear before Caesar. So he spent two whole year, years in a hired or rented house there under house arrest but he was able to preach to those who would come and visit him but what did he preach about his theme his message he preached the kingdom of God and taught them the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ so his theme was the kingdom of God Read Matthew chapter 24 verse 14. What is the message to be preached in all the world? Matthew 24 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. You see, a lot of times we just leave off three words there. We just say this gospel shall be preached in all the world. No, this is not what it says. It says this gospel, gospel means good news, this good news of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. So what is the message that needs to be preached in all the world? It's the gospel, it's the good news of the kingdom. That there is a kingdom. Just as the Lord taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the gospel of the kingdom is that we are in a kingdom 
We're in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter where you live on the face of the earth. You can be part of this kingdom. It is the ultimate one world government. <laughs> but it's a government that is ruled by God. By uh, the witness and testimony of Jesus and the apostles. Read Acts chapter 20 verses 24 and 25. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Notice how Paul in his teaching and preaching he always inserts something about the kingdom of God into it. He wants to let them know that this is a reign, this is a dominion, this is an empire, this is a worldwide empire that we're under we're under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ he's our king he's the one that we serve right so the question is sometimes the gospel of the kingdom is referred to as the gospel of what well it's the gospel of the grace of God that you see there in the last part of verse 24 the gospel of the grace of God. The unmerited favor of God. Out of his goodness, out of his mercy, out of his steadfast love. That he has made us a part of his kingdom. Not that we deserve it, not that we earn it, but because of his grace. Read Luke 16, 16. Which says the law and the prophets were given until John. Talking about John the Baptist. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached. And every man presses into it. This was the message of John the Baptist. It was also, the, he said repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's the exact same message that Jesus began his ministry with. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So it is impossible to understand the message of Jesus without a basic understanding of the kingdom. The kingdom was the message that Jesus spoke and the only one his, he uh, instructed his disciples to do what? To preach. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. We have to proclaim it. Preaching is proclaiming. And what is the proclaiming? It's the good news that the kingdom of God is here now among us and that we need to manifest it as his sons and daughters, that's what we are to do. To bring the kingdom of God into reality in our world. Read Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. This is part of the prayer of, that Jesus taught us to pray. I just mentioned it a few minutes ago. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. What is heaven like? Is there crime? Is there violence? Is there sorrow? Is there grief? Is there pain? Is there trouble? Is there confusion? Is there discord? Is there wars? No. So that's what the kingdom of God should be like here upon this earth. That there should be no confusion. No warring, no violence, 
No stealing. No killing. No immorality. Is there immorality in heaven? No adultery. No stealing. No coveting. So that is the prayer that we should be praying every day. That God's kingdom become manifested here upon this earth. We want your kingdom to come, Lord. Wouldn't it be glorious? You know, I was talking Sunday that about the fact that when I was growing up, you didn't have to lock your doors. You could leave your windows open. There wasn't fear of someone coming in and breaking in and doing violence to you. But what has happened? Because we've let this culture get out of control. We've taken God out. And when you take God out, you're going to have, you know, the kingdom of Satan instead. And I tell you, the kingdom of Satan is one of hatred, murder. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. There's nothing good about the kingdom of Satan. Read Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, and Romans 14, 9. So Colossians says, Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And Romans 14, 9, For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. So, within the phrase, the kingdom of God, is an idea of a group of people that would ask Jesus into their hearts, be, accept God's rule, and reject Satan's and receive his forgiveness, or C, join the church? Well, the best answer there is B. Accept God's rule and reject Satan's and receive his forgiveness. Next, we have read Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, which says, From that time... Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So in order to enter God's kingdom, a change of heart is required, right? And this change of heart is what the Bible calls repentance. Read. Acts chapter 26 verse 18 to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they might receive what forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith that is in me so question is, have you turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God to receive the forgiveness of your sin? To be in Satan's kingdom is to be in the kingdom of darkness, but in, to be in the kingdom of God is to be in the kingdom of light. And we want to get out from under the power or rule of Satan and instead accept the rulership or headship of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Read Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27 and Acts chapter 11, verses 15 through 18. So Ezekiel 36, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, 
and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Acts 11, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as on us in the, at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So have you been given a new heart and a new spirit that causes you to walk in God's ways? As it talks about a new heart, take away that stony heart, give you a heart of flesh, put a new spirit in you. Have we done that? For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us we believe, who believed on the Lord Jesus, what was I that I could withstand God? <clears throat> when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then has God also to the Gentiles regrant, granted repentance unto life. So we just need to repent of our sins to confess them before God and to accept the grace that he bestows to us through his son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. Then read Luke 18, verses 13 through 14. <clears throat> and the publican, or the tax collector, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So there's no room for pride and arrogance and looking down on other people passing judgment upon the lives of others in the kingdom of God. You know, we've got enough to deal with with our own issues. So the question here, have we called upon God for the forgiveness of our sins? You know, God be merciful to me, a sinner. There's nothing to the cross that we can bring, only to the cross of Christ. I clean. We can't cling to our goodness or righteousness. That's not going to cut it. All of our righteousness is like filthy rags before God. There's no comparison of our righteousness and His. But we are to, we are in this process of going from glory to glory. We're in this process of being refined and purified and made into the image and likeness of God. We have to be put in that furnace of affliction sometimes to burn off some of the dross that's in our lives, some of the issues that we have to be conformed to the image and knowledge of God. But we're in a kingdom. We have a king. It's King Jesus. And just to emphasize again and again that it is the kingdom of God that we are a part of if we make Jesus our Lord and Savior. He is King Jesus. But, you know, as he taught his disciples, he's a servant king. He's willing to get on his hands and knees and wash your feet. He's not one to, he says, we're not like the Gentiles. We don't lord it over people. We're not asking people to, so to speak, bow down to us. But we are to submit ourselves willingly to the goodness and the mercy and the grace of our loving Heavenly Father. We do have a king and his kingdom. And that should be our message. It should be the gospel of the kingdom of God. 
Wouldn't that be glorious? We think about, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven. You know, it's going to be great. Well, we're here for a reason. We're, we're here to rule and reign with Christ here upon this earth and to bring the kingdom of God into reality in the world around us. So let's change the world. That's one thing that was the testimony of the early disciples. These men have come here. They're the ones that are, are turning the world upside down. They're changing the world. They're changing lives. And they're changing cultures. And just think, 2,000 years later, we're still talking about the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Let's do it. Let's make the kingdom of God a reality in our world, in our nation. Let's make America what it needs to be. It needs to be part of the kingdom of God. Amen.